Hello and welcome to episode 200 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. This week on the show, Norway has been called an EV utopia. We dive in to find out why. Fun fact, their best selling EV is the Fjord Focus Electric. Therapists say that climate change is fueling a new kind of anxiety. To help combat this problem, we're going to start each episode with 20 minutes of deep breathing exercises. Okay, now, everybody, with me now. Breathe in. And breathe out. You know, 20 minutes might be a bit long. How about two seconds? All right, done. Okay. The final details of the Chevy Equinox have been released. It's questionable how affordable it will end up being, especially since the fourth wheel is optional. An angry mob in San Francisco has set fire to a Waymo self-driving car. Things really have changed. Why, back in my day, people rioted over sensible things like losing the Stanley Cup. All that and a lot more this 200th edition of the Clean Energy Show. <clears throat> Brian, I had a, a dream, had some insomnia, went back to sleep, had a dream, then I had another dream and another dream, and they're all the same, and that dream was... Uh, I opened up, we opened up, although uh, you weren't in the dream, you were somehow mm -hmm. a part of this, uh, a charging uh, plaza north of the city. <laughs> okay, yeah. And uh, I was completely focused on that, and I, I bought it spontaneously, this piece of land, I don't know how, I saw it at a TV show, somebody bought us something spontaneously. Before yeah. I went to bed, it ended up in my dream, <laughs> so I bought it and to charge, yeah, it was, uh, it was weird, but I was focused on being a small business owner and uh, marketing, and uh, people were coming to the door. There was houses <laughs> there for the staff, <laughs> and a restaurant, and a bar, and yeah, Charging Utopia indeed, which we'll have more on the show later. Uh, how are you? You went to uh, Saskatoon and came back with something extra. Yeah, so picked up our Model Y in Saskatoon this past weekend. Uh, we did the FSD transfer thing, so they've opened that up again for a limited time. If you bought full self-driving in the past for a Tesla, you can get it now transferred to a new one. So we went ahead and did that and picked up the car, and yeah, fairly uh, uneventful. But uh, it's great. Model Y is great. It's uh, obviously a very nice car, and it's very successful. Uh, there's, there's a reason people love it. It's great. Well, can you be more specific? Like, I know it's easier on the knees to get in and out because you don't have to do a squat to yeah. uh, get down in a sports car level. But um, other than that, I mean, is it roomier? Is it drive nice? How, yeah. how would you say? Yeah, it's just roomier and you've got that higher seating position. So the visibility is a little nicer. And, you know, it's just always great to have a new car. It's got that new car smell, like oh, everything is clean and, nice. and perfect. The last uh, time it'll be clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Until it shows up in your detail guy again. Um, well, that's nice. And wow. I can't wait to have a drive, and I've never been in a Model Y, and I've never even sat yeah. in one for some reason. For sure, why. yeah. Uh, I wanted to mention the Fisker Ocean really quickly. So Fisker is an American car company that they sort of had a, like an expensive luxury car out before, but they've been, you know, talking about their kind of affordable, I mean, it's still kind of expensive, but affordable uh, SUV. So it's now out, the Fisker Ocean. And uh, I just wanted to mention it because uh, MKBHD had a review of it on YouTube, Marquez Brownlee, and um, he called it the worst car I've ever reviewed. Yeah. he. Did you he watch did, that? I did, and I saw the title, and it drew me in, and of course, I knew. <laughs> uh, I thought it might be a VinFast, but it's, a, it's the Fisker, so. Yeah. Um, but he always has nice things to say. You know, he's, he should be Canadian. <laughs> He's always got nice things to say and say, well, they can improve this. Then it's possible that they could come back with the software over the air yeah. or an update and improve these things. Yeah, it, it seemed unnecessarily mean because it's, uh, I don't know, it looked great. Like it's a great looking car. The paint job is amazing. It's got some cool hardware things like it's got a center screen that's kind of like the Ford Mustang Mach-E where it's vertical, but then you can rotate it. It actually rotates to horizontal. Uh, that was cool. And it's got solar panels in the glass roof, which can then retract like a sunroof. Uh, so again, I thought that was kind of cool. So the glass roof... It lets sunlight through because like a lot of solar panels, they're not fully, you know, translucent or opaque. Um, so I, I thought that was great. So, but basically the software is terrible. So it, it seems like great hardware, bad software. 
Uh, but, you know, at, at least it doesn't run on gasoline. So I, I thought his headline was a, a little mean, like, you know, it, it, uh, it it's 2024. Cars shouldn't run on gasoline. That's really the main uh, criticism I've got. That's true. Did you did you happen to try the FSD, the full self-driving software on your new car and see if it was transferred successfully? Uh, it was definitely transferred successfully, but you know we didn't didn't really. The use hardware it. is the same, though, right? It's not going to be an improvement. In any... Yeah, okay. I believe the hardware is the same. So it, you know, it just ends up saving you a bit of money because you don't have to buy then like enhanced autopilot, which is probably what we would have got was enhanced autopilot rather than the the full S FSD. But yeah, so uh, we're going to have to sell our, our Model Three soon. Is your son the electrician using the uh, Model Three out of town, or do you have three Teslas in your driveway? Right now. Uh, we have three in the driveway. Yeah, we're going to sell the. Doesn't that gonna, uh, draw attention? It's a, <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. Uh, yeah, but we'll be selling the Model Three uh, sometime soon. Okay, well that's interesting. Uh, also, this week's show, European automakers are teaming up to fight the Chinese invasion of automotive uh, cheaper cars. Uh, India is going to put solar panels on ten million homes and spend many billions of dollars doing so because it will be. Uh, Helping the poor, in part, as so they claim. Um, yeah. If anybody, if if you all, well, I, I got to ask you this. Uh, you went with the Model Y because you wanted, well, it was a good price, right? It was the same as the, the Model 3 for some reason. They started, The starting prices were the same when I looked it up in Canada. I guess, yeah. The, the prices have come down a bit, so it's not as prohibitive. Well, but, how could they uh, be the same? There was always a, a, a major... Um, you know, extra expense to get the Y. How could they be the same? Has the three gone up, or is the there's just you know everybody's want, clamoring for the revised three right now? Yeah, that's right. So they recently refreshed the Model Three, so there's kind of new demand for that again because uh, it seems like quite a, a a serious improvement. So yeah, usually the Model Three would be priced below the Y, but but currently the starting price is the same because people want that new uh, refreshed Model Three. Well, it seems like a good time to buy then, and they had some right on the lot, which is unusual for you because you've never bought off the lot before. Yeah, no, the first Tesla, we had to wait f about four or five months for it, and then the next one was a couple of months, got interrupted because it got hailed on in Calgary, and so we had to get a different one, uh, et cetera. But yeah, it's, and we're going to talk about this a bit later when we talk about Europe, but, you know, EV production is starting to catch up a little bit to EV demand, um, so it's not as long typically to wait for an EV. Right. Well, um, I wondered why you didn't go with a Ionic 5 or an EV6 so that, you know, figured your calculations. Were you thinking about it? Yeah, it, it mostly wasn't my choice. My, It's really my partner's car, so it was really her choice. So that's what she went with. She's now familiar with Teslas and how they work. So I think that was a big part of it. You know, having to learn a new operating system for a new car, which in this technological age uh, would be a little bit annoying. And of course, the charging network. It's, you know, it's just a no-brainer. If you're going with an EV, Tesla is still kind of the, the kind of default choice. Um, so, yeah. Speaking of charging networks, if you watch our uh, other uh, social media channels closely, you'll know that I was ecstatic this week. Ecstatic! Because my Bolt just got better. My Chevy Bolt EV that we've had since the spring, it got yeah. better. And Bolts don't usually get better, Brian. <laughs> the only way they get better is a massive uh, battery recall, and then you get a new battery if you've owned it for five years, and that's pretty cool. It's not cool having only you know your battery restricted to 80 percent for three years like some people are but yeah that's that's cool uh it's plug and charge so i yeah. um i could not believe you know i was looking through an american uh facebook page of the bolt and um because that shows up in my facebook feed a lot and i i learn a lot of what's going on i learn some of the bad things too but i noticed somebody had Unrelated posted a picture of their app and it showed the Canadian Flow Network. Brian and I are in Canada, if you're new to the show, and we don't have a lot of options. There's been plug and charge for the Bolt in the States for a while, for a couple of networks. Uh, EVgo is one. I think ChargePoint is another. We don't really have charge points where we are. We kind of have some level twos in BC, I noticed. Uh, not too many uh, level threes there. So uh, I, went, I didn't have to set anything up. All I had to do was say activate in my app, my Chevy app, 
and then it takes me to the flow page which is the network in Canada it's also in the states but it's mostly in Canada right now and it's the one I love because it works the most and it's simple mm -hmm. and I've talked to them on the phone a few times and it uh, I just entered my information you know username and password and but a bing but a boom it knew my VIN number and by knowing my VIN number which I couldn't believe it did from previous charging you yeah. know, I you often don't think about what's going back and forth on non-Tesla vehicles, but it actually did have my VIN number. So all I had to do is that, and it worked. Like I went to the local dealership and uh, plugged it in, and it worked. And then yes. I went to another one and plugged it in, and it worked. Because, you know, I'm thinking back to the tension I had during my trip to uh, the West Coast last summer, and I was always like, you know, what should I do? Should I plug it in first? Do I swipe first? Do I... Uh, do I use the app? Do I use a credit card? What do I use my um, yeah. my uh, little uh, RFID card that they gave me for Flow? What's the best way to do this? And it's just like Tesla now. You just plug it in. Now it's a forty-two second wait or thirty-nine second on one of my trials, but mm -hmm. uh, that's a little slower than what I understand Teslas do. But it only took nine seconds to identify and approve the car. The rest is a handshake, so it might be yeah. The way the bolt is uh, for you know finding on what charge it's gonna accept, and presumably you had to put in a credit card or something too. Well, I my I already had one in my Flow account because right, um, so it's you know, because it's through Flow, yeah. So it's I think it's set up to renew twenty bucks at a time. So it'll if I use all my money, then it says okay, we've charged your account twenty dollars for that much more, and you know, so yeah. I I get emails and I I know how much electricity I've used and things like that. And um, my kid is uh, in uh, Saskatoon where you bought the car. He's not there now. He's home for a while. But that's a place that I go to because I have a, a, my son there. So uh, the, a better route planner, which is the one that we all use who are not Teslas, uh, did not have the midway point on that trip. Uh, it took it offline for some reason. It shouldn't have. And I fought for a month and a half to get it back so I could plan my trips <laughs> to that city. And it's finally mm -hmm. back and working. And uh, in the summertime, I can easily make it all the way. And in the wintertime, well, it's not even that cold. It's been a lot colder, and it takes about 22 minutes of charging, which yeah. is a, a pretty serious thing, you know. Yeah, I noticed trip. the handshake is a little quicker on the Tesla version 3 superchargers. Like, it's only like 5 or 10 seconds. And now the version 2 is it's a little bit longer, like maybe 20 seconds or something. But either way, it's it's both pretty seamless and now as long as you're using a flow charger it sounds like you've you've got that too yeah there's lots of flow chargers around and it's it's one less thing to go wrong too you know because a lot of the times it's when people say the charger's not working it's the payment system that's not working so yeah. if they can just you know flawlessly read your car you still got to stick around for 40 seconds you can't walk off to the restaurant because yeah. you, you want to make sure it's working i mean you can check your app but you want to make sure it's working and, and plug it right back in again if it if it weren't, because that would be a major time consumer. Yeah, see, I think because the Tesla ones can be so quick, five or ten seconds, they must not check the credit card until later. And we did have a problem one time when our credit card had expired, but it wasn't kind of until the next charging stop that it showed itself. So I think it let us do the first one because it does the handshake in five or ten seconds. So, yeah, there's not enough time to check your credit card. So it just waited till we did our next stop to tell us, you know, something was wrong. Yeah, I think I can. Can you set up a backup payment on your Tesla account? I should know because mm, I've actually set up yeah. my. I, I've I've actually set it up on my, because uh, the Tesla network's open and my wife and or I may be going to a place that has the, uh, the charging uh, Tesla uh, Magic Docks in Calgary. So yes, yeah. we'll no, I'm not sure if there's a backup or not. All right, well that's uh, uh, happy news for me and. Uh, What's next, Brian? I, I, my dream is uh, that uh, Chevy will send me a uh, Tesla adapter in the mail for free, like Ford is doing for its customers. Yeah, but they won't. They're going to charge that would money. Be amazing. I'm not going to buy it, <laughs> but it would be pretty cool. All right. So your charging anxiety is lessened, but a story here from Bloomberg suggests that climate change is fueling a new type of anxiety. Say therapists. And this makes total sense if you think about it. You know, climate change is obviously a very serious issue. And what psychiatrists and psychologists are struggling with is exactly um, how to deal with it. So there's an example here in the article, like if 
if a, a person has a fear of dogs, well, then there's a certain kind of prescribed routine that you can do to help people get over their fear of dogs. But uh, no one is quite sure yet how to get rid of people's fear of climate change. And it's got an interesting sort of take on it. Like, you know, psychologists in the in the article are saying things like, well, yeah, it makes perfect sense that people are uh, anxious about climate change. Like, this is a very real and very serious thing. Um, and, you know, sometimes anxiety comes from nowhere. Sometimes your brain just makes you anxious for no reason. And then other times it's tied to something. So this is the kind of anxiety that's that's tied to something. And that's usually the kind of anxiety I have as well. If I've got a big day the next day, lots of things going on, I, I tend to get anxious. and, and Like the 200th episode of the show, for example? <laughs> I slept like a baby. I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, All right. But yeah, it's um, so. There's a lot of interesting things in the article. Like I said, it's it's uh, you know still trying to figure out how to deal with it. It's it says that climate denial could be a part of this. So there's still a lot of people out there that deny that climate change is a real thing, and it could be because they're anxious about it. It could be that it's a defense mechanism that. You know, it's it's to imagine that climate change is real is to imagine a lot of, you know, very possibly bad consequences. So, you know, if you just switch your brain and, and say, OK, well, climate change isn't real, then, uh, you know, that's a potential way to ease your uh, anxiety about it. Well, coming up later in the lightning round, I'm going to talk about a survey that found out how many people are, in fact, denying climate change. And I have a different view of that, which I will give you then. And, oh, and that view is that uh, it's pretty small, and there's a small number of people who believe a lot of crazy things, Brian. <laughs> a lot of crazy things, and I have the numbers to back that up. But they they tend to drive a lot of the conversation. But that's true. The uh, the, the yeah, article I'm... ends with you know one of the notions is it does help to try and do something about it. You know whether you volunteer or or donate money or something, and maybe we don't have any anxiety because we do a podcast. We've done 200 episodes now. So this is how we deal with... Uh, I have to tell you, it does help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it does help. <laughs> if, you, if you have a lot of climate anxiety, start a podcast. Um, yeah. But and, and if you do a lot of reading around it, you will find a lot of the good news stories that we find. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the whole world isn't going to flood once the ice caps melt. But, uh, you know, the change is happening and it's happening pretty quickly. What I'm anxious about is the fact of, of how much the climate's already changed you know yeah. I, I think of last summer where it was smoking i had to close my windows uh that's depressing as hell i mean it was there was other bad things too but yeah uh, that's never happened before in my lifetime that i can uh remember and it's just i don't want to live in a world like that i i i, I the one thing that keeps me going as a canadian is my beautiful summers and yeah. uh you know that's the only way you survive winter is to have that summer at the end of the rainbow, at uh, the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, even. And if that's crappy, I don't know. Yeah, and we did, and I think this helped for me. Like we did have to change our thinking around that because you know we talked about this when we put in our heat pump. We've never had central air because it just didn't seem necessary but then it seemed like well we're getting more hot days every every summer but then it seemed we were getting more smoky days because of there's been uh, dry conditions so we've got all these forest fires so you know we had to shift our thinking and fortunately we could afford it we could afford to put in a heat pump but part of the reason was because of the smoky days in the summer and we're expecting more of them this summer because it's still been dry it's going to be a, a smoky summer again but you know, we can keep the windows closed now, so that's something. But you've got a fresh air heat exchanger. Have you thought about how that affects it on a smoky day? Because I would love to have one of those. I should have yeah. one of those, and I don't. Yeah. If you've got a fairly tight envelope in your house, if it's fairly well sealed, you should get something like a heat recovery ventilator to make sure you get fresh air, and that, you know, should filter out most of the smoke as well. It's It's got a filter on it? Well, yeah, There's there's filters in it, yeah. Okay. I thought it was just a, just a heat exchanger, but you're saying that it actually does do some filtering. Well, I mean, there's a whole, yeah, there is some kind of a filter inside of it. I'm, I'm not sure how serious it is. I do have a uh, air purifier, a major one that I found on wire cutter recommended. And yeah, 
yeah, that goes off sometimes just when I walk near it for some reason. It's kind of insulting. <laughs> it's like, what's up with that? All right. Well, uh, CNBC and uh, the DW, the German Broadcast Network, both had features out this week on how Norway built an EV utopia. Uh, the CNBC one was titled How Norway Built an EV Utopia. Well, the U.S. is struggling to go electric. It's on YouTube. It's free. I highly recommend it. It's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more than a half an hour, but it answers everything. It covers everything. It's well researched. It's fairly done. And um, yeah, I'm actually really impressed. It, I, if, it's hard to recommend something that, you know, takes 30 minutes. But if you're yeah. having anxiety over what, uh, you know, the EV market will be when we're all driving EVs, well, Norway is already there. 25% of the vehicles on the road in Norway are electric. And 90% have a plug of new car sales. And next year, in 2025, they're hoping to, to get that to zero, except for vans that will be accepted uh, for a little while. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they've done all kinds of things uh, all the way back to the 90s. You can see a chart here uh, of all the different things they've done. Um, and it's just, <laughs> it worked. You know, and people didn't scream. Yeah. I mean, some people scream, but most, for the most part, society has accepted it and been quite happy because, you know, at some point there's so many of them around that you know that they're not bad things. They're good yeah, things. Yeah, and because they started doing this decades ago, it's been a more gradual transition where I think, like, it's a bit of a struggle in the U.S. right now because, you know, Biden and the Inflation Reduction Act, it's a fairly fast transition because you know the u.s was kind of behind now the norway power grid is largely powered by low carbon um, hydro and they're adding renewables to that as well as they uh, add electricities in the hydro will be used as kind of the base load and even as a battery if they turn it off for a while and and uh, get some of the water so this was the cnbc's uh reporter's first time driving an ev when she rented a bmw in oslo um so that there was that you know this is kind of a quite a contrast to the story the cbc marketplace did a couple of weeks ago yeah. where they were looking for negative things it just it seemed like a, a very different way of uh, approaching this um so she had a few hic hiccups but not much um, the reporter noticed the quiet streets and the lack of fumes, which was quite amazing. The streets are quiet in Oslo. The air is pleasantly free of fumes. There's been a noticeable improvement to the air quality in the city? Yeah, it is. Uh, so around 20% reduction of local pollution. It was actually noticeable when a gas-powered car sputtered by. We did find a few people who still drove gas-powered cars. Some couldn't afford to buy a new car, and others still couldn't get past range anxiety for long trips, despite the abundance of chargers. My son took me for a drive in his combustion vehicle yesterday, and I couldn't tell if it was working hard and not working well, or if it was just the combustion thing, because he says, you know, Dad, you haven't been in the combustion vehicle for a while. What's it, what do you think? And <laughs> I said, well... I'm not sure. Is it working properly or is it just always this way? So it's it's a different experience. Like you really hear those things working uh, when you press the pedal. Yeah, they can be kind of noisy and not great. Also in Oslo and Norway, all the ferries, all of them are electric now. I don't think we've said that on the show. We've talked about them getting ferries, but all of them are now electric. Wow. And they're like a megawatt chargers that they they pull up to. It's quite huge and uh, the trains are, are electric and trucking is transitioning quickly to electric and they're actually getting rid of subsidies for uh, PHEVs now that's the hybrids that plug in and have a little bit of all electric range and they're not going to incentivize those anymore they'll be treated the same as gas cars pretty quick um, here's another clip would you say that the environment is a very important piece to why people are buying electric vehicles here or is it the the price of the cars. I don't think you Norwegians know, are more environmentally concerned than other people. So it's the economic that is the most important. Climate emissions is, of course, a nice bonus and also important for a small group of people. Yeah, I, th I find that here, Brian, that, you know, we're all motivated by the client, by the climate, but yeah. really it's, it's the technology that we're going for and the, you know, the economics, right? I mean, that's, 
very few people are, are doing it for the climate. I know a few, but the, largely, yeah, it, it's not their first concern. It's it's a benefit. And, it's a side benefit. And especially if you drive a lot, the more you drive, well, guess what? That's um, you know a gas bill that you don't have to pay for. Sometimes a gigantic one uh, if you drive a lot. In Norway, the restaurant chain McDonald's finds itself competing with gas stations, which they now, by the way, call energy stations because they're just not gas. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, electricity. It's energy stations. So that might be something that we could look forward to the future, a name change. You may have heard it here first, energy stations instead of gas stations. They still are operating on uh, low margins. You know, the electricity is a low margin, the same as the gas, but it's getting them in to buy the high markup items like a Coke or whatever. Yeah, and McDonald's in Norway, it sounds like they've got chargers at maybe all of their uh, locations. Yeah, and Burger King has to compete with that. So, because, you know, yeah. uh, I, it's true. When you're on a trip, you want to stop where you can get a bite to eat. And I'm not going to be too discerning at this point of the transition. Yeah. But I'd rather not walk two blocks to a restaurant if there's one, you know, 50 yards away and it's a McDonald's. I'm happy to go there. Uh, they're not only fueling people, you know, these restaurants, they're fueling the cars. It's it's a big deal now. And that's something we might be able to look forward to here. Again, this whole thing in, in Norway, is there, it's like looking into the future. And, you know, the grid is not collapsing and there's not that many growing pains, actually. Um, the, one of the biggest problems I think now is that they're finding harder to make grid connections for new charging stations, uh, because, you know, there's only so much extra power in certain areas and then they have to yeah. sort of, you know, build up the grid in order to, to put a charger there. Yeah. Each district kind of has a maximum amount of electricity from what I understand. So yeah, sometimes in certain neighborhoods, you might be kind of reaching the max without having to do major upgrades on the grid. Is it actually the gas station company, Circle K, that paid to put these chargers in? Yeah, so the fast charging market is more or less fully commercial market. Circle K is one of the big fast charging companies in Norway and also the biggest like, gasoline chain in Norway. Are they going to be able to make as much money from charging as they did from gas? Well, they don't have a big profit on gas either. Mostly it's also the convenience store where they sell them food and coffee and drinks. That's also, of course, more relevant for EV owners because they, when they charge, it takes more time than filling up a tank of gas. So maybe they stay here for 20, 30 minutes. They can make money there as well. There's a company called Certus that runs this ESO station. We have a deal with them that we split the costs 50-50 for the whole installation here. But then we also split the income 50-50. So, yeah, they talk to charging companies, policymakers yeah. and the government, regular people on the street, uh, even somebody who drove gas, you know, to see why. And their excuse was they couldn't afford a car, they claim. Of course, you, you should keep your old car, you know, for as long as it's useful to you. Yeah. If you can. Um, so, yeah, they're going to take off the... Uh, uh, the 25% VAT tax, they're taking that off uh, EVs now, but they're going to remove that option soon because there's too many EVs. And uh, they're allowed to drive in the bus lanes. There's many incentives that they had initially, and one was driving in bus lanes, but that's ending now because there's too many EVs in the bus lanes, right? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So, But now you have to have a carpool. So if you have multiple people in the car in your EV, you can drive in the yeah. bus lanes. So uh, there's no range anxiety, they say, anymore. But charger anxiety, chargers not working uh, sometimes, but it's much better now, and the payment systems are the biggest pain. So I say to you, Brian, why not have an Interact, you know, like we have in uh, bank machines and things like that, or a Visa Pay or some sort of ubiquitous payment system yeah. that pays a little fee to the other person, but you just have one payment method. That's what we need. I don't know what's stopping that. Yeah, or at least tap to pay as a backup if the app doesn't work or something. So here's a list of some of the interesting things I learned, and I, I did find it quite fascinating. Gas stations, like I said, are now called energy stations because the chargers are more important. Um, bad, I guess this is the pushing of the buying of EVs was too hard, the government says, that you know people were giving up, because they were so much cheaper, they were giving up their gas cars prematurely, and that doesn't make it very environmental if you don't use your gas car for the life right. of it. Right, yeah. Uh, 
So that was something that they maybe have are having second thoughts on, actually, which is interesting and uh, something we can learn about in the rest of the world. Uh, not letting the gas cars run out of their life cycle, and, and w that encourages manufacturing, which is maybe unnecessary. So using less buses, this is interesting to me, too, because people are taking cars instead of buses into the city. Because it's so cheap to operate the EV, it's cheaper than the bus. So they say, well, why should I pay a premium for a bus when I can go on my own little car, listen to my music, or do whatever? So they have to respond to that by lowering the prices yeah. of bus transport. And they spend a lot on this, Brian. $800, well, $800 US equivalent are spent per inhabitant on EV subsidies, which is a lot. But it's certainly yeah. worked. Uh, the government is planning on phasing out new incentives because EVs are the new normal now, and they don't really have to make them the new normal anymore. Uh, public level two charging used to be free when they started out, and that was a burden on the cities and the municipalities uh, and paid for by the taxpayers. But now there's a small fee to use them. Level two is something that you charge into for hours instead of minutes. And uh, it's usually cheaper because it doesn't require a big grid connection. It's something you can even have in your home. So 8% of ICE vehicle sales remaining to eliminate, um, basically. So it's 92%, I think, was the latest figures had a plug. And they said a lot of that has to do, that last 8% is people who like Toyota. And Toyota, <laughs> as we know, has bugger all for EVs. They've got one that they aren't really pushing, and that's been problematic on its launch, like many of the other legacy automakers' EVs have been. Uh, Toyota's a strong brand there, and uh, not really anything to show for it. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It, it's, you know, brand loyalty in cars can take many, many years to change. And we all know that Toyota has huge brand loyalty. People love Toyota. And since Toyota's not offering EVs, that's, yeah, going to take some extra time. Norway will end the sale of new ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles, that is, if you're new to the show, in 2025. Fans are getting a last-minute extension and around half a million vans are registered in Norway. This corresponds to 15% of the entire vehicle fleet, but 27% of the CO2 emissions, just like trucks are a small percentage, but um, a big percentage of, uh, you know, emissions. Yeah. No, we know that vans are going to be uh, a, a big part of emissions, especially in this sort of new economy where everybody's uh, buying everything off of Amazon. So... The thing that I take away from this, for the most part, though, is the comments about the air. They call it an EV utopia in our way, but the end result that stuck with me was this. The streets are quiet in Oslo. The air is pleasantly free of fumes. Fantastic. Okay, so from Drive Tesla Canada, Waymo vehicle set on fire in San Francisco. Did you hear about that, James? I ain't, not until I read the script this morning. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> what's wrong with these angry mobs of people, Brian? Yeah, well, you know, we talk about this a lot on the show, is that it's not going to be a smooth transition to uh, self-driving vehicles. And, you know, the, whenever there's an accident, it, it makes big news. You know, of course, human drivers cause thousands, perhaps millions of accidents every year. But uh, when it's a robot doing the accident, uh, people tend to get angry. So, yeah, Waymo's self-driving car was set on fire in San Francisco. This was about a week ago as we record this, um, marking a significant escalation in public hostility towards autonomous vehicles. So this was a Jaguar I-Pace. This is an Thank electric God it vehicle. wasn't a Bolt. That's all I actually thought that when I read it. <laughs> because they pelted it with cans, the poor car. The, yeah, the mob were... was, was stopping for a street performance and they pelted it with things. I hate peltings. Yeah, so there was some kind of street performance going on which caused the self-driving car to have to stop because they usually stop before they <laughs> run into people. But uh, yeah, you know how these things work. Somebody just somebody threw a firework inside the car, uh, setting it on fire. And this was after people were sort of banging on it and hitting it with uh, skateboards and stuff. So, you know, this is... Uh, I guess this is people standing up to the robot uprising. 
Um, but, you know, I think autonomous vehicles are definitely going to be a part of our future. Um, and it's partly because of what we were just talking about. It's These are all EVs. Autonomous vehicles so far have been all EVs. And, you know, those are cleaner and cheaper to operate. So they're going to make perfect sense in terms of taxis. You know, there's cameras on those things, right? They do know there's right. cameras on those things. No, and of course, you know, whenever there's a riot like this, there's always video footage of some kind, even if it's not from the car itself. People have cell phones. It gets on social media. So, you know, it's a crime to set a car on fire, even if it's driven by a robot. So, you know, typically speaking, people are going to uh, probably end up getting uh, some kind of charges for this, the ones at least whose faces are clear on the various cameras. Brian, the Equinox EV is near and dear to my heart. Why? Because... I'm poor, and it was promising <laughs> to be a better vehicle for a low price starting at 30000 US. I, When they announced it in Canada, they didn't announce it, but when they said it's coming a couple of years ago, they'd started around uh, 35000 and went up to thirty seven approximately, they said, and then the price went away, which is never good. There's been lots of inflation and product shortages yeah. in the last two years. So they a couple of weeks ago or so they announced the American pricing, but now they announced the Canadian pricing, and it is st supposedly starting at thirty thousand U. Uh, pardon me, thirty five thousand U S. But the range went up. Um, they're not having a lower range. There are going to be three hundred nineteen miles, which is five hundred twelve kilometers. Which is pretty good starting. Yeah. So the same battery pack for all the trims. Yeah, and that's that's pretty good. Uh, for an economical EV, that's really good. And maybe I'd like to think that's the new normal. The maximum charging speed is only 150 kilowatts, which is low for a new vehicle, but it's three times the maximum roughly of what my Bolt EV is. So that would be an improvement. Maybe overall it would only charge twice as fast. You know, the peak doesn't mean, depends what the charging curve is because it doesn't stay at the peak, obviously. Uh, prices also include the destination fee which is like $2,500. So if you add the the fact that that's including the destination fee of $2,500 and the extra range of 100 you know, kilometers or 60 miles, then it it's really not that bad. But what I don't understand is that the 1LT, which they haven't announced yet, they say in the United States it's going to be 35000 The only difference is, you know, heated steering wheel and uh, heated seats and a front light bar and it adds up to thousands of dollars like six seven thousand dollars for that yeah that's the only difference that that can't be right there's got to be because you know i i can go for 25 dollars buy a heated seat plug it into my uh, cigarette lighter type thing and it works just the same way almost it's not you know pleasant looking but it's there yeah well, it's often difficult to even get the low-end trim on a car. Dealerships don't typically want to sell those. So, you know, they can advertise a starting price that's that's really good. But then you get to the dealership. Maybe they don't have those in stock. Maybe it's got to be a special order. And you get tired of arguing with them. So you end up, you know, buying the heavier trim, even though maybe you don't need it. Yeah. You know, I, I had to buy, you know, $300 mats for my car because that's what the previous guy ordered and he canceled his order. Oh, yeah. They're not worth three hundred dollars. They're pieces of rubber, <laughs> and I think we actually ordered our own for a hundred dollars that are much better. They're laser fitted. So yeah, it's it's uh, in Canada. GM Authority, which is this uh, GM blog, which is really has a lot of connections to General Motors insiders, and they're usually very accurate. They're estimating forty one thousand uh, after you know. Canadian as a starting price, but again, I'm skeptical because you're not going to knock off six, seven thousand dollars for those things. Um, but if they do, that would actually make it cheaper than what the Bolt is currently listed for, even though they stopped manufacturing them in December. There's still some around, and that's the price is like 42, so it's a much bigger car and much yeah, bigger prices. specs. Prices have sometimes come down. I know there was a big announcement. The Mustang Mach-E has been reduced a lot in Canada. So, you know, we've hit that kind of demand plateau, uh, you know, which we're probably going to talk about in the next story. So it's $7,200 between the 1LT and the 2LT for those heated seats and, and the front light bar. I mean, come on. That's there's something that GM is just, when you see things like this, you know something's not right. You know, when you see a charity do something weird, 
you realize that you know maybe the the owner is skimming off them or something like this it doesn't make sense there's something fishy about this that they're they're not being up front i mean mary bear the uh ceo of uh chev or gm said that they can't sell an ev for under forty thousand and make a profit right now so in the states i guess they'd be losing money again on this uh equinox but again it brings people over i mean they go all the way up to fifty eight thousand from the Canadian price goes all the way up to 58,000, which is actually pretty good because in American dollars, that's 63,000 and theirs only goes up to, uh, no, that's bad. It's bad. No, actually the American, the American, uh, highest trim is 46, seven in us dollars. And that's 63 Canadian, but in Canada it's actually five grand cheaper at 58,000. So anyway, um, yeah, it's just, if you compare it though, I mean, once you get pricey, if you don't have that one LT that's well equipped, like in Canada, we often get the uh, heated steering wheel and seats as a baseline option, right? Yeah, like you would be crazy to buy a car in Canada without heated seats or heated steering wheel, at least in 2024. Especially in an EV, when you use a lot yeah. of your energy on that, on heating the cabin, you want to maybe... It's kind of a given, yeah. But we do always have slightly different trim levels here in Canada. And people think st heated steering wheels and seats uses a lot of power. It does not. It's like uh, 100 watts, 150 watts, and it cycles on and off. So that's not much power in an EV. That's that's nothing when you're using 7,000 on the, you know, to heat yeah. up the car and the heater. No, I think we talked about one time if you were stranded in the woods with an EV that you could run the heated seats for like a week or something. Did you yeah, figure out? Yeah, yeah, over a week. Two weeks even yeah. in some cases. <laughs> I, I don't know if that would keep your blood from, you know, getting the hypothermia level if you turn it on high and just kept heating away, but maybe it would. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. So the other vehicles, though, you know, once you get to around 40,000, though, the Y in the States, the Tesla Model Y is 45,000 right now. Uh, and you, what you don't really realize is that Tesla's come fully equipped. There's not really different trim levels. The trim levels on Tesla's are... The performance of the motor, the number of motors, the all-wheel drive. You've got an all-wheel drive version, so it's got two motors, the front and the back. And, um, you know, there's performance versions, of course, which are racetrack worthy. And uh, But for the most part, Tesla's come with everything that you get. You, you get it in all the yeah. cars. It's something I haven't thought of for a while because I've kind of taken it for granted now. But, yeah, Tesla was really trying to disrupt the auto industry, not just in terms of the drivetrain, but yeah, you don't have to go through that rigmarole. And of course they don't have dealerships either. So everybody say it pays the price that's on the website. You click the button on the website to buy it. You don't have to have a conversation about, you know, should I spend $7,000 on the heated seats? So the, the Model Y, however, does come with a hundred kilometers less range. So it's actually a fairly short range unless you buy the long range model, which you did as well, right? You bought the long range model. Yeah. It's around 500 kilometers. Um, yeah, but it's about the same price, and it, it, they're just not going to compare. Like, you're going to have the charging network, complete access to the charging network. We're going to see just how good of an advantage it is once they start making the NACS connectors and all these cars, the Tesla connectors, to see how yeah. much of the advantage it is to have a Tesla to have the access to the network. For one thing, though, it's kind of pricey. So, you know, for non-Tesla yeah. owners. Well, one would think it's going to help once the other automakers can have the Tesla connector built right into their cars. That's definitely going to help. But yeah, the question is, how much is it going to help uh, against Tesla, which has kind of become the default electric car at this point? So the, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 standard range is 220 miles of range, which isn't a lot, actually. It's less than 400 yeah. kilometers, but it charges fast. It's an 800 volt architecture uh, allows... A lot of charging speed up to 300 is it 350 kilowatts that allows i think it's pretty close yeah. to that and now it doesn't stay at that level but you can charge the car from 10 to 80 percent in uh 18 minutes which is you know i don't know it still needs a bit more range for us though in, in cold climates but yeah so you got that and that's the same price as the 2lt and i'm sure it's equipped the same and just less range. So it's, I don't know, you're going to have to be a Chevy fan to buy this vehicle the way I feel. In Canada, though, we got different pricing and the, the Ioniq 5 is actually prohibitively expensive. But in the States, where most of these things are sold, most of our listeners are, that's going to be the case there. The Volvo EX30, uh, which is compelling, compact, it's, 
uh, SUV, it's 275 miles range. That's really good um, for 36,000. But of course, in Canada, it starts at 537, uh, which is way, way too expensive. It's five grand more if you converted the. We're getting punished for being Canadian again. I hate it. Yeah. I was. I didn't choose to live here. I was born here. You know, don't you add a five thousand dollar fee on after. Uh, yeah, it's not fair. No, we we do tend to pay uh, a little bit more. Well, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, we're kind of heavy on EV news this week. And so this next story is from Bloomberg. And they're suggesting that the European automakers are talking about possibly teaming up some more because they're really starting to feel uh, the Chinese EV automakers breathing down their necks, as it were. And so Volkswagen, Renault, and Stellantis are thinking the unthinkable, exploring tie-ups with sworn competitors to make cheaper electric vehicles and to fend off their existential threats. So we talk a lot on this show about how, you know, at some point it's going to be a problem for legacy automakers, even if they did it perfectly. A switch from gasoline powered to electric cars is very difficult to pull off because, it, you know, you don't want to end up making cars that nobody wants, but you can't kill your gas cars too soon because those are the cash cows and they're tending to lose money on EVs until they get them uh, kind of up to scale. And we have reached a bit of a plateau in terms of EV sales. It used to be, yeah, you had to wait several months to get an EV kind of no matter which one you wanted. They're, they just weren't able to make them fast enough. But in the last year, that's kind of switched around. And, uh, you know, even for Tesla, this is becoming a bit of a pro problem. The slowdown has led to lots of discounts, as we know, with Teslas and other vehicles. And uh, uh, there's been a 20% share slump this year, last year that has erased $150 billion from the market cap of Tesla. And, um, yeah, it's because they're just not getting those sweet, sweet profit margins that they used to. But, uh, yeah, it could be we're nearing the point where this is going to be a real problem for legacy automakers. The example from the article here, the BYD Dolphin, this is a Chinese car. It's 7,000 euros less than the ID3, which is a very similarly equipped car. Uh, Volkswagen so far just can't make the cars cheap enough. And so they're kind of, you know, working on a, a plan B. I thought these numbers were pretty staggering here. This is... The number of people employed in the European car industry, it's 13 million people. That's oh. just a staggering number of people employed in the European, uh, you know, car industry. And that's 7% uh, of the EU economy is tied to these automakers. So um, the example that they used here is Airbus. So Airbus is a European company that was started in the 70s when they realized that they were kind of falling behind what Boeing uh, was doing in terms of making large aircraft. So several countries got together to kind of pool their ideas and resources to create Airbus. And at that time it worked. So this is a kind of a similar strategy um, if they end up following through on it. Um, you know, it's, it's getting to crunch time. And if they aren't able to make some improvements and make them quickly, um, you know, there's going to be real trouble for the European auto industry. And, uh, you know, it's coming sooner rather than later. You know, uh, Boeing, they've cut so many costs that their planes are falling out of the sky now. Yeah, it's, I, these things move in cycles. It's, uh, it, yeah, it's not good. But the, the legacy automakers, uh, they rely on auto parts manufacturers. They, they farm everything out. And they can't get together and find efficiencies that Tesla and the Chinese automakers have been doing. Uh, I don't know about how Korea is doing. They seem to be making very compelling vehicles for a price that is not high for what they are. Um, but I, I think that, you know, they've slowed down their EV ambitions because they got scared about the rate of uh, increase in EV sales slowing down. It's still, you know, high year over year, but... The rate has slowed down a little bit, and it's uh, anticipated to slow down even more this year. But they're going to be screwed, Brian. They're going to, they're not, they're, this is a, you know, not the time to slow down. Yeah. 
and I don't have them in front of me, but there was a couple of stories this week too about parts makers, parts makers in Europe that are having massive layoffs because, uh, you know, everybody's struggling and uh, it's, uh, it's time to somehow turn it around. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate, clean energy, and transportation. Moment Energy announces a battery storage project at Vancouver Airport where retired EV batteries will be utilized to support high-speed EV charging. Did we talk about that before? I don't know, but I've noticed we both, uh, I was in the Vancouver airport and I think we did talk about how they've got lots of signage around that the airport is is working hard to get to net zero. Oh, uh, according to a new report by the Center for Climate Integrity, a nonprofit organization that advocates for legal action to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable, the plastics industry has sold plastic recycling to the American public as a something that they could um, help make sales work if they say that it's recyclable. And it turns yeah. out it's not. They claim it <laughs> evidence that could provide the foundation that this is a, a study that uh, the C... Okay, I'm going to start this whole thing again. According to a new report by the Center for Climate Integrity, a nonprofit organization that advocates for legal action to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable, the plastics industry has sold plastic recycling to the American people to sell plastic. Now, a lot of plastic, most of it comes from petroleum. They've been lying for 50 years years brian they claim that uh, there's evidence in this study that will provide the foundation for legal efforts to hold fossil fuel and other petrochemical companies accountable for their lies and deception they're coming after you the study now proves this and it's going to open the floodgates of legal action and i hope that happens yeah legal action is a great way to hold polluters accountable We've talked about uh, California taking away solar incentives. Well, now they're introducing a bill to reevaluate rooftop solar net metering. The bill would require the Utility Commission to consider total benefits of rooftop solar, including improved local air and water quality, avoided land use impacts, and associated symptom associated sip and associated system cost benefits. Remember. When Governor Schwarzenegger uh, had his million solar roof initiatives, this was long before the show. But we yeah, were watching. I don't remember that. You don't remember that? No. Oh my God, no. this was big solar news for us solar yeah. enthusiasts. Uh, well, they're at two million now. I think that was uh, at least well, it's pretty, it's approaching twenty years ago. I think there's now two million uh, roofs in California have uh, solar, according to uh, PV Magazine. Uh, just a second. Ah. It's time for nuclear news. This is from the cool down. Uh, government approves construction permit for new type of nuclear reactor for the first time in decades. This is a major regulatory milestone. Getting construction permits took nearly two years. The Hermes demonstration reactor will be built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I believe it used molten salt as the cooling. So it's a different sort of technology for cooling. People are very excited about that. However, in Europe, the EDF, uh, that's Europe's main nuclear power operator. They're from France, the majority shareholder in the UK's Hinkley C, Hinkley Point C uh, reactor that they've been building forever in Britain. They are trying to persuade the British government to help finance two flagship nuclear reactor projects in the UK after reporting a 12 Point nine billion uh, pound or no euro loss uh, write down on the Hinkley point. Twelve billion write down. Under the worst case scenario, Hinkley could now cost forty seven point nine billion to complete. The initial brine was eighteen billion. Um, back yeah, that turned out to be a lot more. It has to fully shoulder the bill after its Chinese partner CGN stopped making payments to cover cost overruns as the British government took steps to push it out of the nuclear sector following a deterioration in relations with Beijing. And, you know, this has been a huge cost overrun, but you know what? 
Uh, Greenpeace saw this coming seven years ago on this clip. The government is right to really review the evidence because there isn't a shred of evidence that this deal actually can go ahead. Everywhere the EDF has tried to build a similar kind of nuclear reactor in France, in Finland and in China, they're not working. All of those power plants are both over budget and behind schedule. And we believe that that's going to be the case for Hinckley as well. Well, say so what you want about Greenpeace. Uh, the spokeswoman was correct seven years ago. And at that time, the UK government paused the project to rethink it, even though it was like years into the construction at that point. And with the government and the ratepayers paying the bill, the investors are on the hook for nothing. It's you and me. It's the government and uh, that we pay taxes to that's going to be flipping the bill for this. This is how it works. The bottom line is that the people will pay the price on their power bills because no matter how much the project costs and the budget balloons, the owners of the power project will be able to impose something called a strike price. Meaning that even if the cost of one megawatt in a wholesale deal is 20 pounds from other power sources in the UK, the government has to cough up 106 pounds or more per megawatt for the duration of 35 years after the plant commences operations. It's going to require a lot of editing. It's a CAS fast fact. About 80% of the global population lives in countries that are net importers of fossil fuels. And uh, Jason Aquaman Momoa converted his vintage 1929 Rolls-Royce Phantom II into an EV. Uh, it looks like something Mr. Burns would drive. No, it's a bit <laughs> bit beyond that, but it's 584 horsepower. Even old-time EVs rock now. And it's funny, I went to, um, when we were in uh, Los Angeles on a vacation a few years ago, I decided we were on Ventura Boulevard to pull into a grocery store and just see what the vibe was like. And in there, there was this eccentric man who came in with this long cigarette on a... Um, on a cigarette holder. I've never seen, I've only seen that in yeah. the movies as a, a sheltered small town Canadian. He had the cigarette on his long cigarette holder and he was driving a vehicle just like that. Uh, it was such a <laughs> weird experience, <laughs> or at least it registered that way with me. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act is poised to save New Jersey electricity users $300 million annually from 2025 to 2032. That's Biden's... Um, Climate legislation that most people don't know about as a new federal tax credit to keep existing nuclear plants running. So, yeah, he's paying the bill and the, uh, the, the state does not have to subsidize the nuclear. He's keeping them running himself. Nearly 15 percent of Americans don't believe climate change is real. Brian, I found that number fairly small. We were talking about that earlier in the show. Yeah, and it is starting to shift. Sentiment is kind of shifting from, okay, climate change is not real to, okay, these climate solutions aren't going to work. So there is progress, but yeah, 15% not believing in climate change. That's a decent number, I think. That is decent. And, you know, uh, they say it's uh, become stronger because people see the effects of climate change. It's hard to ignore it. Certainly uh, in the northern uh, half of the U.S. that's got our smoke from Canada last summer and us, we know these things aren't normal. So uh, I thought it was pretty good. 15% of Americans probably think their neighbors are lizard people. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> yeah. from outer space. Like, and this is true though here, 10% think the earth is flat. Seriously, one in 10 people in the United States thinks the earth is flat, according to surveys. Okay, that one seems too high. That's it does seem too high. high, but it's a different world post-pandemic, Brian. People are gone crazy. 12% think the moon landings were faked. 20% in 2021 thought it was true or probably true that the government was using COVID-19 vaccinations to microchip the population. 20%. Wow, that's really high. Mostly Republicans. Uh, the largest population of poor people after India is Nigeria. The main form of transport for the capital city's poor is two- and three-wheel transportation. Rickshaws and uh, motorcycle taxis. But the country is considering banning them just because e-transport companies, just as e-transport companies are starting to set up shop, they're thinking of banning them. Why? Because they say that the uh, criminals are using them and the kidnappings are occurring on these <laughs> modes of transportation and other okay. crimes. Well, it's easy for us to say 
to sit up on our uh, high horses in the first world here. Uh, New York City is considering a laundry pod crackdown. Laundry and dishwasher detergent pods made with polyvinyl alcohol, or PVA, contribute to plastics pollution in U.S. waterways. If approved, the bill would take effect on January 1st, 2026. That was on Bloomberg. Uh, Ford, as you said, cut the Mustang Mach-E prices. Uh, in Canada, it's actually up to $13,000 for their most souped-up trim and five grand for all other trims. And finally this week, in legal news. If this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. The Supreme Court of New Zealand decided to allow a novel climate change claim to proceed to trial. This is Smith v. Vonterra. The Supreme Court reversed an earlier decision of its Court of Appeal allowing uh, an individual plaintiff to proceed. This is one person suing uh, these big corporations to proceed to trial with his claim against several New Zealand companies. Uh, the plaintiff is an elder of an Indigenous tribe and a climate change spokesperson for a group of New Zealand tribal leaders. He alleged that Seven defendant companies are responsible for emitting greenhouse gases or supplying products which release greenhouse gases when burned. Mr. Smith alleged that as a consequence of the defendant's activities, uh, they have damaged and will continue to damage places of cultural, historical, and spiritual significance to him and his community in New Zealand, and we wish him well. That is uh, actually a big deal that has been reverberating around the world because it's going to come here. Uh, all the places are going to say, hey, should we be doing this as well? Best of luck to Mr. Smith. All right, that is our show for this week. You can contact us at cleanenergyshow at gmail.com and around social media, we are Clean Energy Pod. You can find videos from our show on TikTok and YouTube, including special content not featured on the podcast. Have a look at the Clean Energy Source. Uh, have a look at the Clean Energy Store for merchandise. It's there, the link, it's in your show notes. You can donate to the show financially like many people do. We appreciate you. If you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And Brian, I couldn't believe that I had to go to the template for the script and change it from 1XX to 2XX. It's amazing, just bloody amazing. Congratulations on 200 episodes and we will see you next week.